I'd like to call to order our uh, first council meeting of 2020, beginning a new decade, uh, to order for Monday, January the 13th. And I'll begin with our uh, territorial acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge that uh, we're holding this evening's meeting in the traditional territory of the Hussainic people. And I think given that we're starting a new decade, it's appropriate to, uh, to speak for a moment of the importance of our relationship with First Nations, um, not only in the region and, and the South Island, but uh, locally on the peninsula with the four First Nations, and that uh, we continue to be engaging in our relationships, whether it's uh, with uh, town staff, uh, council members as they're doing their uh, council work and committee work, uh, our community organizations, I know the Mary Winspear Center, the museum, the, Shaw, the aquarium for the Salish Sea, for example, have built relationships uh, over the years. And uh, of course, uh, the CRD does as well, and, and uh, regional organizations uh, such as SIP, who's here this evening, and the relationships that they're continuing to build with our First Nations. And I'd like to move on to uh, approval of our agenda. Second. Um, any amendments? Uh, call the question, those in favor? Motion approved, thank you. Uh, we'll now move to public participation. Uh, our usual public participation period uh, of about 20 minutes, asking speakers to uh, uh, present their comments in about three minutes. Uh, please come forward to the microphone, press the little button so you see a red, red light that we can hear you. Uh, give us your name and, and address and we'd be happy to hear from you this evening. So calling for any speakers for a first time. For a second time. And for a third time, seeing none, I'll bring public participation to a close. We have no, uh, we have no hearings, our public hearings this evening. We'll then move on to presentations, and we're pleased to welcome uh, Bruce Williams, uh, Interim Chief Executive Officer of SIP, uh, to make a presentation um, on the South Island Prosperity Partnership. Thank welcome. How about now? Here. Excellent, thank you. I used to be a broadcaster. I should probably know that <laughs> stuff. Right there. Thank you, Councilor. Somebody did that for you. Uh, the snow is lovely, though, you know, despite the challenges it had. It's beautiful to see it. Um, and as my mother used to say, snowflakes on their own are beautiful, but when they all get together and hit the ground running together, that's another matter, when they all work together. So that's kind of what we're here to talk about tonight is working together. Moving into the messaging. I would like to uh, join the Mayor in acknowledging that we are gathered on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish Nations in the South Island and the Wasanich Nations, of course, on the peninsula who are a part of our partnership. In fact, all nine of the nations in the South Island are now part of the South Island Prosperity um, Private-Public Partnership. So we include the Seot, Sartlip, Sakem, Pakwachin, Songhees, Esquimalt, Chianu, Esquimalt, and the South Nations in our group. We also include in our membership 10 municipal governments. We have two more pending and the relationship uh, for this municipality is represented by the mayor, who also serves on our Municipal Partners Committee. So thank you, Mayor, for that service. Our organization is, as I say, a public-private partnership for those in attendance who aren't fully aware of who we are. We are the Regional Economic Development Agency for South Vancouver Island, and our membership is reflected here, and that membership is made up of nonprofits, of industry associations, major private employers, the First Nations, and municipal governments. And our private employers include businesses operating on the peninsula, such as Thrifty Foods, RBC, Island Savings, Butler Brothers, The Airport, Coast Capital Savings, BC Ferries, BC Transit, TELUS, CIBC, TD Bank, all of the nations, of course, uh, and we all get together to work on behalf of those who live in Sydney and work in other areas, and uh, all of our, you could probably say pretty much all of our employees have residents who live in Sydney, and uh, your businesses here have uh, employees who work in other parts, or sorry, live in other parts of the region. So we are entering the fourth quarter of our fourth year of operation. We are working under our three guiding purposes, which are number one, create household sustaining jobs. Number two, facilitate and accelerate self-directed economic development for our First Nations. And number three is to attract investment to this region from provincial and federal governments. And I am here tonight to ask for money. I'll just be perfectly honest with you. I'm here to ask that the uh, Town of Sydney continue its funding of our organization so that we can continue to do what we do for the benefit of Sydney businesses and residents and for the residents of other parts of our region who travel here to work, to shop, to play, and for the residents here who work in other parts of the region. You will notice that there are a number of letters of support that have been submitted for our, uh, our submission for tonight too. And I'm gonna highlight some of what we've done in the last year and then a couple of slides to show you to indicate some of our performance measurement. Um, at our AGM last June, which by the way was held in Sydney at the Mary Winspear Center, 
We passed a resolution to include a statement uh, dealing with the mitigation of climate change into our constitution. Our AGM in June of this year, by the way, will also be close by. We will be convening at the Say Out Nation, and you're all invited to attend us, uh, join us and attend that on June the 25th. We have expanded this membership base. When we began three and a half years ago, our membership number was 27. We are now at 58. We've been active in the agriculture sector, working to create food security and sustainability, helping to reduce GHG and carbon emissions by exploring the feasibility of locally based food processing. Very important matter for all of us. We're also exploring the feasibility of establishing an abattoir facility to address those issues. Big part of that, of course, is that it creates jobs, but it also means that animals being dispatched don't have to be taken away from here for that to happen. The trauma experienced by food animals and having to transport them away from their farms is a major issue. We're working on establishing that in this region too. We've been included in some workplace gender equality and immigrant inclusion roundtables. We have been successful in attracting business to relocate here from other parts of the world, from the United Kingdom, from the United States, from Brazil, from other parts of the island, from British Columbia, and from other parts of Canada. And we have a large campaign under the banner of something called FDI, Foreign Direct Investment, which is the ability to go and attract businesses to come and locate here, build the economy, and hire people to create a sustainable economy. We've done some gatherings, something that we call a thought leadership series related to stakeholders providing insight and knowledge about how we can collaborate and achieve more together as we grow our economy in a sustainable manner. It's called the Future Of Series. Uh, one of them highlighted our future relationship with our largest trading partner, the United States. The future of diplomacy spoke in consideration of the temperament of the current administration in the United States. We got that perspective with a really great dialogue on diplomacy from a gentleman named Bruce Heyman, who was the ambassador to Canada for the Obama administration. We had the pleasure of spending a few hours with him. We gathered for a dialogue about the future of skills and education with our three post-secondary presidents. And we gathered for a dialogue about the revolution in workforce skills and what we need to be prepared for the advancement of technology, artificial intelligence, data, and all that's coming to us in the digital and technology world. We are working right now with the Victoria Foundation to distribute some funds into social enterprise opportunities. That is money that's coming from the federal government being managed by the Community Foundations of Canada into the Victoria Foundation, and we will help with the disbursement and the, and the adjudication of where those monies will go. We are currently helping with economic impact studies being generated by both CFB Esquimalt and the Greater Victoria Harbour Authority. We're currently involved with plans to establish an ocean futures cluster and marine innovation hub on the shorelines of the capital region. A similar project in Halifax has been very successful. It's called COVE, which you may or may not have heard of, but it's C-O-V-E. It's innovative, it's impactful. If they can do it, we can do it. We know that. We'll create jobs, we'll create investment from governments and private enterprise. It drives innovation, it addresses ocean science, climate sustainability, and of course includes the traditional historic knowledge and practice of our First Nations. Speaking of which, we convened something we called the Indigenous Prosperity Gathering. We gathered our South Nyland nations together to discuss their aspirations, their hopes, their plans, their dreams, their challenges, their needs, their capacity to collaborate on self-directed economic development. In the process of that, I had the honor of meeting with chiefs, counselors, managers, elders, and their youth, and asked them to direct us in the ways that we can best help them be all they can be. That event, in fact, was so engaging at the close of it that they have determined that they would like us to convene this event quarterly, which we will do. As soon as I find the money, we're going to go do that. But we're on track to find that. Half of the funding for that came from Western Economic Diversification. So we're on track now to find our half of that. We will go to WD and we'll continue that on a quarterly basis. Very, it was so humbling. I have some pictures of that to show you in a couple of minutes here. We're also working on a plan for an indigenous owned on demand micro transit system. Our reserve residents, of course, are at a disadvantage when it comes to connecting with our economy because of the challenges created by inadequate transportation and mobility options. Hitchhiking to school, there are no immediate transit options. There is not an incentive there to complete education. Difficulty connecting with healthcare, supply lines, family and friends. It's not right, it's not safe, it's not healthy, and it's not fair. We're in the process of creating a feasibility study on the establishment of that system, owned and operated by the nations, for the nations, which would be on demand, which means efficiency and convenience. It also, of course, means wireless connectivity for many of the nations who don't currently have that, which is just another level of isolation they live with every day. We create something every year called the Prosperity Index, which is an indicator of the trends in our economy year over year. 
to see where we're performing well and where we need to do more work. And we're currently in the process of starting an organizational review as we enter into our fifth year, as we wrap up year four. We're going to audit ourselves to see how we're doing, to find out where our successes and strengths are, where we need to do some more improvement, and what else we can do to make things a little bit better in our world. These are some things that we'll address for you uh, where we have been over the last little while. So these are performance indicators. Number of new businesses attracted to the greater Victoria area. Right now, we're at about seven, but there are some more pending, which will come along soon. We're projecting by the end of year five to be up around 10. Job growth is something that has, it's been an interesting challenge. We had an initial projection that was quite high. Um, things to consider in that are the fact that our jobless rate is what it is. And it's a very slow process to do this. I think, to be quite honest with you, we underestimated this. Um, economic development and the attraction of business is a very slow burn. Uh, the businesses that we have coming here right now, those conversations started three years ago, three and a half years ago, two years ago, just now coming to fruition. So as we see this increasing more and more, we have some trade missions coming up very soon to go to areas that have expre expressed rather a very profound interest in being here. In particular, two of the companies that we brought here are from Brazil. Uh, things in Brazil are kind of interesting right now, as you probably know. Uh, these companies have expressed an interest in bringing their operation here. Uh, one of the companies, it's really cool that they've gotten together. There are 17 Brazilian families that have moved here. They get together every week on Sundays. They go to a Portuguese church service. They have a barbecue after. They talk about things. They talk about life. They coordinate and speak with other Portuguese families. They probably play soccer. I think, too. I would be willing to bet that they do that. But that's the kind of thing that we like to build with what we're doing in our creation of job growth over the years. Uh, we do something called Business Connect and also something called TAP, the Trade Accelerator Program. That's where we gather together SME, small business enterprise, who need some mentorship. They've come to a certain level in their operation. They want to ramp up. They want to grow. They want to create more jobs, more revenue. We mentor them in that sense to help them be all they can be. And over the last couple of years, we've dealt with 27 companies the projection from that in sort of a rough estimate is that it's going to create somewhere between 75 and 100 jobs in this region as those companies grow. So we've been very proud to be a part of that going on too. The Songhees Innovation Center is the center that was created by the Songhees Nation. Um, they wanted to do something that would harbor a place where indigenous business and innovators could live and flourish and function. We were instrumental in achieving them the funding they've needed to create that organization and that spot within their space. Uh, currently, that number has already been achieved. They're already at 20 employees. We made this slide a couple of months ago, but they now have over 20 people employed in the Innovation Center who are all Indigenous-owned businesses creating their own future and their own successes. And our membership numbers, as I've mentioned, have gone from 27 to 58 currently. We have a whole other bunch of them uh, in the pipeline coming along shortly. Um, the First Nation membership, I mentioned, we are now fully up to nine. So the one that's not in there is the Esquimalt Nation who joined us last month to give us the full complement of the nations in this region. So speaking of the nations, this is the Indigenous Prosperity Gathering. To the best of our knowledge and what we've heard from the nations was that they had never been convened, uh, Councillor Wainwright would know this better than I, but had never really been convened together in this profile and in this event to get together and talk directly about uh, prosperity and economic development for the nations. There's some of the group that gathered together. We were at the Songhees Center in November. Um, we had a graphic recorder on site. These are words that were spoken by the mouths of the people who attended. If I can do a little bit of a regional geography mention here, there was a, a, a bit of an issue when the Johnny McDonald statue came down downtown. Top right. The future, every time this phrase is said, it reawakens the indigenous child John A. MacDonald tried to kill. These are words that came out of the mouths of people who attended this event. We're not statistics. We're not socioeconomic gap. We are not a problem. We must move beyond the negative. We are different communities and nations, but we all need to work together. One of the great things that came out of people's mouths when they were there was, we need to do this more often. I only ever see you at funerals. And it was remarkable to see the number of the people that came in from the different nations who had never met each other before, because this sort of a, uh, a convening episode had never really hap hap whoops, there. Uh, they talked about partnerships that work. Hire from each other's nations to increase capacity. Salish Sea Industrial Partnership, Songhees and Esquimalt currently doing that. Lateral opportunities, employees can work anywhere, but to do that, they need transportation. They need to get to point A to point B, and that's why we're working on the transportation mobility. They want to work on tourism. Keep in mind importance and transparent and trusting partnerships. SIP Partners Committee needs reps, which has already happened, actually. Major employers are asking SIP for workers of all ages, and we're also working on that. 
Fiscal management access to capital, huge deal for the nations. That was identified uh, with a survey we did with them beforehand. The First Nations Finance Authority lending to First Nations. Getting flexible loans to meet and plan what your nation wants. At this event, we brought in nine financial institutions to meet face-to-face -face with the nations to talk about the relationship that they've had historically, which is not good. I think we all know that. Some groundbreaking conversations were had at this event. It's a way of getting out from under the Indian Act. Each nation has a different approach to treaty, to access to capital, to no treaty. That's another conversation that was held that was really quite amazing to hear. The idea of wellness, the reason, for example, that the Songhees Wellness Center is called that, <coughs> Any community, whether it's a First Nation, whether it's Sydney, whether it's a region, whether it's a province, can only be successful and achieve at the level that its wellness permits. If you have systemic issues with mental illness, with addiction, with chronic suicide, with the things that are challenges, facing the results of residential schools that have been imposed on these nations for years, they have to heal themselves and be well enough to succeed before they can achieve the success they aspire to. So community wellness was a huge focus of what we did that day. When we brought this group together, we had a counselor on standby because we know that very often this can go to a dark place pretty quickly. Uh, this one didn't, it got quite emotional, but it didn't quite go there. But we were indicated, it was indicated to us that we should do that. We had hired an indigenous owned company to facilitate this event for us. That was a recommendation, a recommendation that they gave us. So strong and kind leaders from the nation. Quarterly band meetings allow people to speak their mind, which is why they m wanna meet with us quarterly too. Sharing stories, hearing ideas, having fun, gathering for more than funerals. There it is, right there. I think I have one more. Yeah, so the microtransit system. Um, we're under process right now of examining how this can work going forward. Uh, when the pilot is launched, it will be on the peninsula. It will be with the Wasanich uh, Leadership Council and the Wasanich School, whoops, is where it will start. And then we will be able to scale that, we hope, not only here across this region to the rest of the island, to the rest of the province, and across Canada, where places like the Highway of Tears have those same issues that it's not safe for indigenous people to travel all the time. So I think that's kind of about it. Yes, it is. So we have a monthly newsletter. We would love it if anybody would like to subscribe to this. It'll tell you everything we're doing. We're going to be creating something on a more regular basis too. Um, I can send this information to council for you to subscribe to that newsletter to keep up with what we do. Upcoming events, strategic planning with council and residents. We have a process underway right now. We'll be coming back to Sydney to ask for your input into what our strategic plan should be and how it can best benefit you and the, uh, the goals that you have for economic development. Uh, foreign direct investment, business investment outreach, we're going to be doing that. The agriculture supply gap projects I referred to earlier. The index will be happening. We're going to grow our membership. One of the membership things that we're looking at right now is that we are likely going to be creating a platform for all of the region's chambers of commerce to gather within South Island Prosperity where they can have a platform to work together within a committee that we would create so that they can talk about the regional issues that they all share some chambers have a capacity a little greater than others. We want to make sure that they're all on an even playing field to protect the local autonomy that they have to represent their members and their municipalities. Uh, so that's something that we also aspire to, and that was it, that we aspire to do uh, a little bit sooner than later. Um, that's about it. We're doing something with um, Esquimalt that I mentioned. We'll get back to you on that. And we also have an availability for the smart guy in the operation, who is a gentleman named Dallas Gislason, to come and do a presentation to council and staff on Economic Development 101, what exactly does that mean? There are common principles, but there are individual things that can and cannot succeed in each municipality. So helping Sydney establish what the best plans going forward are for you, we'd be more than happy to offer that resource to you. Um, that's all I got. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you for that information-filled presentation. Uh, Thank I'll you. ask uh, Council if uh, they have questions. Councillor O'Keefe and Councillor Pallet. Um, I have a few, one at a time or all at once? Um, Keep it to a small number okay, to start. We'll see how it goes. Okay. Uh, hi, Bruce. Uh, hi. Thanks for the presentation. I, first of all, I'm interested, uh, if you could give us a little bit more information on the micro transit that you have, just a little bit about how that works. And uh, I presume that that's with BC Transit, is no. it? Oh, it's not. Okay. No. So a little bit more about that. And then I guess what I'm really interested in is how that might work to address the problem we have out this way with uh, people uh, who can take the bus to, to, to Sydney, but they work over on the west side. So how okay. this sort of model might uh, alleviate some of those concerns okay. for so our west side businesses. Great, thank you. Through the mayor, this one would be something that's for the nations. 
So oh, okay. it would be something for the First Nations who have the enormous connectivity challenge that they do, connecting to the economy, to education, to health care, to social things, to culture, whatever it might be. So uh, they're in a very unfortunate... Whoop, is my time up? <laughs> they're in a, my eggs are ready. Time up for all. Um, it would be something for the nation so that they can establish a means of getting themselves to and from school, from all the things that they need all the time. Transit does not serve the nations because they don't pay for it. Uh, some of them have different ability and, and capacity to provide their own transportation. We would like it to be something that provides them with the safety and the guarantee that they can get where they need to be when they need to be there within an organization that would be owned and operated by them that would be on demand, which creates efficiencies. There are challenges in the regular transit system that some systems and, and routes are underserved. Uh, this, we think, would bring some efficiency to that. The other side of it, of course, as I think all of you know, any form of transit has to be subsidized. Um, in that world, the word that I prefer to use is sponsored. So it could be that any support for that doesn't necessarily come from public money. It may come from private money. And we, as a public-private partnership, have the ability to source that so that there is no burden on the taxpayer or on the nations that we can facilitate this in a way that's sustainable for everybody. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm, what I'm wondering is whether that model that you're building for the First Nations, whether it's something that could be um, used oh, yeah. to meet other needs. Oh, scaled up, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it actually, okay. that proposal came out of what we did in the Smart City submission from a year right. ago. Another right. element of that in the future, ideally, could be that the same system could be imposed and put in place for people with disabilities who have mobility issues right. with a network that would pick them up when they need to be picked up and pick them up and drop them off and take them. Because traditional forms of transportation aren't always all that friendly for people who have mobility barriers. Okay. So it could grow into that too. But certainly, yeah, uh, okay. uh, everyday transit service could. And BC Transit, in fact, has offered to train the drivers for this, uh, for this uh, plan. One more? Okay, yes. um, and so just one more. I'm in interested, um, you talked about the uh, Economic Development 101. I know you've yeah. worked with other municipalities. Um, you know, we haven't had the opportunity yet to fully develop an economic development strategy for Sydney. We've got a employ uh, economic advisory committee. Yes. So I'm just wondering if you could just touch on uh, maybe some of the things you've done with uh, other municipalities to help them build that and what the components might be. Uh, sure, I mentioned the thing that's going on on Esquimalt. If I may, uh, Mayor, my colleague Mr. Gislason is here and might be able to better address that. So Dallas, come on up. He's the brains, he's the one that does all this stuff. That's enough. <laughs> uh, thanks for the question, uh, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, thanks for having us this evening. Um, just, to, so just to touch on the sort of the relationship between, so when, when the Prosperity Partnership was put together, the mandate was <clears throat> almost entirely um, set up to be a regional economic development body. Um, just the, the, given the sort of the, <clears throat> pardon me, the uh, governance sort of structure of the region and how the economy works and all that kind of stuff. So what we've, what we've sort of discovered um, over the last couple of years is that what the region really needs as part of that regional mandate is an is a interface that, that more closely works um, at the municipal level and at the sort of the sub-regional level, if we could call it that. Um, and so what we've done uh, is we've, we've, it was actually initiated by the Township of Esquimalt, but we've, um, through a few conversations with them, we said, why don't we sort of oversee a project with you? And this could really serve as a pilot that we could then use for other, other municipalities. And um, the two, actually three that come to mind immediately would be Colwood, uh, Saanich, and Sydney, mainly because uh, you're the three municipalities in the region besides um, Esquimalt and Victoria that actually have economic development uh, as an active um, file, other municipalities are, uh, you know, can be a little bit more more passive in the way that they approach it. So, so the fact that you actually have initiated an economic development uh, committee is actually perfect timing for us because now that we get this pilot going with Esquimalt, then we can bring some of those findings to your committee and present them and, and look at options. So, to answer your question more specifically, is the pilot's actually just starting with Esquimalt? We actually just awarded the contract uh, right before uh, the new year, late kind of mid December. And I've had a few sort of uh, exploratory calls with that consultant, um, and we have all the information they're doing. They're doing a whole sort of environmental scan phase right now. We have some focus groups we're doing uh, on January 29th and 30th, um, and then there's going to be a, a couple of surveys that are going to go out to businesses and key stakeholders in in the township of Esquimalt. And then that information is taken back to a planning committee in March, and then that committee is sort of refined. You know what I mean? So it's a bit of a process, um, but it really is based on the on the local. Uh, you know, whatever's going on in Esquimalt. So we would, we would propose the same thing happen in Sydney. We don't want to, you know, just transfer the recommendations across the region into another municipality. It's more about the process that works for your, for your committee and your structure and stuff. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Councillor Fallon. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Bruce, and Thank you. team for that presentation. Uh, a couple of things. You were, you were talking about the, the benefits of the region, et cetera. Is there any way to extrapolate how an individual municipality is, is gaining out of the membership? Is there any way to look at what direct, I, I believe in pulling together. I think there's, uh, there's great advantage to it, but there also has to be something that we can say, yes, we can hook this particular success on that event. Uh, there is. Uh, I think some of that would come out of whatever we might do through this economic readiness program, the thing that Esquimalt is putting together to bring that back here and better determine and, and identify the goals that you want to achieve here. So I think that would be a way to accelerate it. Part of it, though, Councillor, does come down to the regional aspect of it. Uh, when we go back to that page where all the members are, the people that are members of this organization, they live here, they work elsewhere, they live elsewhere, they work here. The measure of it is that whatever happens, whatever we do that's a success is good for the region. Whatever's good for the region applies to every municipality, not just one. Um, probably the, the more direct way we can assist with you is with that, Councillor, I believe you're the chair of that, you know, is to work with that committee to find out and identify what your goals are, what your aspirations are, what's a good end game for you so that we can help you get there. That's, I believe, going forward, how we can best identify okay, that. So we need to do some of our own identification and bring that into uh, yep. And we can help with that too. Okay. I mean, you're going to find out you, through your own public consultation, through uh, business and residents, and of course staff and yourselves, what what it is you want to see here. Okay. So you kind of figure out what what you want to be, and then we can help you on that path to achieve that. Okay. Further to that, yeah. um, I'm really pleased that uh, you have brought in. Uh, you were able to bring in the First Nations, and and so that we can all look at who we all are as local governments, uh, because we're mm -hmm. all governments, right? We all have Correct. our own, so I'm pleased to see that. The other thing I wanted to touch on, you mentioned the abattoir, and I remember an earlier conversation at the uh, the Breakfast Club when we were talking about mm -hmm. agritourism and, and got into that and the like. Is the abattoir intended for larger farm use, or is it really uh, looking at small farms? Uh, will the, they be serviced? My colleague, Mr. Buggy, is here. Kieran could probably answer that a bit better than I. He's been involved in that along with our colleague Jacques Van Campen on that. Uh, oh, Jacques. Hello, Jacques. Hi. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> Sorry. They all snuck in. He's snuck that in tall, and I couldn't see him in the back, but uh, Jacques is the lead on this. Yeah, good evening, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to answer the question. So we're in early stages of that uh, question, and we're seeing that there's different types of livestock that there's a gap here with, yeah. so, so that's part of the... the the uh, analysis we need to do but very definitely we're seeing that the small as well as the large farms are are, are finding a gap in that whole economic chain and they're having to take uh, their uh, their livestock either up island or they're they're in fact not even investing in livestock because it's just not economically feasible anymore so it would be both we would be uh, yeah. able to service both. well I, i'm pleased to see it um i had participated in uh in an opportunity to go to a small farm in the lower mainland and one of the advantages that they were talking it was a, a poultry farm turkey and, and chickens one of the advantages they said was five minutes down the road was an abattoir and um and then it, it it just changes the whole dynamics for their own work commitment but also it's the well-being of the animal exactly that is being exactly right and I, and I don't think that that's something we can l overlook any more of what we're doing to our animals, packing them into these big tractor trailers and anyhow. So I'm pleased to, to hear that. So yeah, I fully you. agree. That's what we're hearing from the farmers as well. It's the quality of the product at the end of the process, but it's also the, you know, the, the care and welfare of the animals up yep. until that, uh, yep. that process as well. Just as a data point, when we talk to the folks at Salt Spring, because they have their own abattoir, um, they said that when the regulations came in and they lost those abilities to have those local services, the livestock on the island dropped in half. Yes. So there's, there's, I think, a huge opportunity that's unmet currently because we have some of those pieces of the chain that are broken still. And so we hope we can uh, help collectively to put that piece back in place locally. Excellent. Thank you very much for the thank information. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Rintoul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, thank you, Mr. Williams, for the presentation. Sure. Thank and, uh, you. Certainly provides some insight in terms of uh, what uh, SIP's been up to in, in recent years, but also some of your uh, your new initiatives. Um, in keeping with Councilor Fallot's uh, earlier comments, likewise, um, you know, I'm keen to see uh, uh, Sydney's uh, you know, particular um, involvement in this uh, moving forward. Uh, and some of the potential uh, uh, 
uh, benefactors uh, in this community. I think you've touched on that and answered that, so I appreciate uh, your comments there. Um, I will note that uh, your willingness has been expressed to, uh, to meet with our uh, Economic Advisory Commission Absolutely. and provide a little bit of a background in terms uh, of, of uh, SIPs operations as well. And so the, uh, I'm the council liaison, but the chair will look to work with staff to schedule an opportunity to do that. We appreciate uh, your willingness to come and meet with our EAC. From my perspective, um, you know, today's presentation is preparing us for recommendations uh, around, um, you know, budgeting and that process. Correct. Um, and we're looking for a recommendation today to 2020 budget deliberations. Uh, for me, and I assume for council colleagues, it would be helpful to see your, your most recent financial statements. Sure. Um, I, staff may have them uh, from previous. Uh, Just happen to uh, have those here. I think it needs to be circulated to to, uh, to staff sure. and, and made available to council and the public and gives us the opportunity to see how your uh, resources are being allocated and, and yeah. where those funds are being spent. I think that would be a piece that I need to see in order to support uh, continued uh, investment in SIP. You bet. Thank be you. Our pleasure. What we have here is the uh, uh, impact report from the previous fiscal, and I can email to mayor and council the, uh, the budget structure for this year and where it's tracking. So we'll get that to you electronically. Be a pleasure. Thank you. Any other questions uh, from council? I just have one, and and um, we know that uh, SIP going into its fifth year as an organization is unique, certainly in its model. Uh, we know that it uh, there were previous regional economic uh, development associations in uh, in Greater Victoria in the Capital Regional District, um, but um, with the model that's in place now, and and with the priorities that you've identified and you've spoken to this evening, how would uh, how would Greater Victoria, the CRD, with a population of you know just shy of 400,000, stack up against other communities its size or uh, or larger uh, in British Columbia across the country in terms of in terms of regional development. We we know that there are organizations. Uh, there's five chambers of commerce. There's tours in Victoria. There's sure. three BIAs uh, in Greater Victoria, and, the, and they all have their roles. But when when it comes to regional development, how do we stack up against others? Uh, we, we differ for one thing in the, the structure of our organization representing this region with 13 municipalities and 10 nations. Economic development across the country, I think almost anywhere else, is solely funded by a municipality. Um, the check is written, the staff is hired, the work is done by municipal staff. Ours is different in that we get funding from different sources. We're also only six people to do all the things that we do. To look at it um, uh, financially, I don't, I don't know if I have that. What it comes down to basically is that if you wanted to look at it from a, um, a competitive edge or a, or a, um, a competitive business plan, uh, we are, other municipalities on average in Canada are funded five times greater than we are by municipal support. I think the average, you remember off the top of your head, Dallas, what it is? Yeah, it's just, just under $10 per capita would be the average in yeah. Canada for a, for a city of this size. It's hard to compare in British Columbia because we are the second largest And we're at a buck 92 right now is where we're at. So, and it, I'm not saying that because we should suddenly ramp up our spending by five times. That's not what we're looking for. That's not sustainable. That's not what it should be. But, you know, because, Mayor, as you said, this, this sort of organization hasn't existed until three and a half years ago. So, in a sense, the recovery from the 2007 downturn in this region was almost the weakest in the entire country because there was no regional approach to diversifying and strengthening the economy. So the GDP growth, which is not the best measurement, but it's maybe the easiest to understand, uh, in this region over the period of time from 2007 to 2013, we fell from fourth in the country to 28th in GDP. That recovery has now started to come back. Uh, we're not gonna take credit for all of it, but we're gonna get credit maybe for people starting to think about it in that way. Um, but to, to look at it on a comparative basis across the country, we are quite a bit behind everyone else. So we looked at at this model as being the most sustainable going forward. Great. And we think for our size, we're doing okay. And not here to brag, but we've been receiving awards from around the world, including the International Economic Development. So the preeminent economic development organization in the world gave us the gold medal for our governance, for the way that we've structured this organization. So we're doing something right. Well, congratulations. And again, thank, thank you. you for the presentation. Uh, thank you for your, your colleagues support. attending and answering questions. and. Uh, Recognize Board Chair Craig Norris. Uh, thanks for coming this evening yes, as well. Thank, Thank you. you for your support and consideration. We appreciate it.
And so, staff, we do have a recommendation uh, before us. Move the recommendation to refer to the 2020 budget deliberations. And second. Any further discussion? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. We now have a second presentation this evening, uh, a presentation by Steve Duck, president of Cycling Without Age, um, and a report on recent activities. Welcome, Mr. Duck. Thank you, Mayor and Council, and thank you for the opportunity to tell you a little bit of, uh, about what's been happening in the last year with our organization. We're actually this month celebrating our second anniversary as a uh, fully formed society. Um, and what I'm going to share with you is kind of what we've been doing the last year. Cycling Without Age is an organization that is engaged in active citizenship. We provide the opportunity for those that are mentally and physically less able to take part in their community. And I want to share kind of what we've been doing over the last year to, to do that. This year we finally, uh, even after a year of being formed, finally got our first bike. And with the assistance of Russ Hayes locally, we're able to put this together and get it on the road. And one of the most exciting things was for our board members to get out and have a little spin around. And literally this was the first time the bike went out and we took out an individual from Sydney All Care. His name is Dwayne. Dwayne has early onset Alzheimer's. So sometimes he is lucid and sometimes he is not. On this particular day, he was having a very bad day. They were having trouble uh, even settling him down. And as you can see, we literally took him on less than a hundred yard ride. We went out of the driveway and did a loop just because we wanted to try the bike with passengers in it. Dwayne's attitude and enjoyment of the day totally changed. And that was so remarkable that we could see that in such a short time that we quickly saw the advantage of this service in the community. And it was the start of the year for us. Our first official ride was with Mary. Mary had never been on a bike in her life. She was over 90 years old and didn't have a, her second leg. She'd lost her leg early in childhood. So she never had the opportunity to ride a bike. Mary died one month later after this ride. And we were part of her service that she wrote. She acknowledged the enjoyment and the pleasure she got out of going on that ride one month before she died. And it was remarkable that we were included because of you know, her length of her life. So we were out in the community and we were very fortunate to get the support of the community in getting us going. Um, along with the town of Sydney and Sydney Waterfront Inn and Suites, the Lions Club came on in a big time and helped us start to offset the cost of a bike. Each bike we get from Denmark costs $15,000. So these bikes are very well designed and built and certainly are, are uh, well worth the money, but getting them here costs as much as the bike does. Um, so we were very fortunate to get the support of the community to get us going and keep us going. Well, so the first thing we had to do was to get out and train some people on taking people up for a ride. This looks like a bicycle, but does not act like a bicycle. And so it was interesting to get everybody out on it and learn how to do it. We put our volunteers through an extensive program. They have to enter the program with an active BC license, driver's license, and also have a criminal record check that includes vulnerable people before they can even start our program. They go through a one-day program of uh, eight hours, going through uh, different things like logistics, riding the bike, learning how to ride the bike, um, loading and unloading people, um, accident and, and, and that kind of resolution. Uh, and then they have to complete another six hours on their own, where there are two of those hours they have to be out with an active pilot. That's a pilot that's already graduated from the program. And they go through... Uh, the, the further training before they even start to take someone out on the street. Today we have a number of our volunteers here that have been that, and I'd like to inter get them to stand up just to show you the type of people we get out on this. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have, I'll tell you more about our, the 25 volunteers we have. But it's interesting because uh, people think that you have to be old to take a ride on our bike and not. It is not true. We service the entire community of anyone that's mentally or physically less able of all ages. 
And that includes inviting pilots to come and join us of all ages. In the world, worldwide, the oldest current passenger is 107. The current oldest pilot is 90. And that's the person who takes the passenger out for a ride. In our volunteers, our oldest pilot is over 70 years old. So it's a possibility for everybody. We also this year became the first registered society as a charity for Cycling Without Age in Canada. We're still the only one and we hold that distinction. Uh, there are over uh, quite a number of different affiliates in Canada, but we're the only one that is an active registered cha charity. That will give us more opportunity for fundraising and building what we hope to have as a fleet of bicycles to service the Sandwich Peninsula beyond Sydney. We are also in instrumental in forming the National Cycling Without Age body. There are over 50 affiliates across Canada. There are over 2,000 worldwide. But in Canada, there's 50 and another 30 waiting to get started. Typically, these are associated with a care facility. We are the first and uh, currently one of half dozen freestanding nonprofit societies. Um, we were instrumental in getting it started and leading the way for others to take on this freestanding structure, which allows us to freely supply the entire community rather than a single facility. And as you well know, uh, Sydney is well represented by a number of care facilities, as well as being able to reach out and service other populations, such as schools and care facilities. One of our members, our board members, uh, took upon himself to ride from the Arctic Ocean to the Salish Sea this summer. And when he got back, he brought together a little seminar. We, had, we held a, a, an event that helped raise $1,500 for the program. As well as along the way, Bill told the story of Cycling Without Age for those that he met up with. We also named our first bike, Bill's Bike. And that wasn't because of Bill Brooks you saw in the former picture. It's because of Bill Foster. Bill Foster was a member of the Lions Club and passed away this past summer. And he was instrumental in helping us fund our bikes and get it on the road. And so we thought it was appropriate to recognize him for his contribution. We also worked with the airport authority to get all the center bollards removed from the <laughs> pathway. And as you can well appreciate, as a cyclist or even a parent with a child, having that center bollard out of the way makes it a little more comfortable to ride around the airport. And we're thanking the airport for doing that because it, it made a big difference because really there was no sense in having those bollards there. Um, and we would suggest that the town of Sydney needs to look at their pathways and consider whether they need that center bollard or not. Um, and I would hope that you take a look at it and see that you don't. For the first year we participated in the Sparkles Parade and we got all our volunteers out, a number of them. The uh, passengers in the sleigh or bike are, uh, active, are active passengers and we went out and enjoyed the Sydney Sparkles Parade which was great. We had our reindeer pulling our sleigh around there and I think it was kind of comical because we were the first Santa in the parade and it was quite interesting for our Santa not expecting it to have little children running, rushing out to uh, meet Santa. So it was quite a, a lot of fun for us. We've been uh, fiscally responsible in managing our program. Um, we're now in our, completing our second year, which closed out December 31st, but we've been able to gently increase our fundraising as well as keeping our expenses under control. And we continue to be uh, that responsible for the community in that respect. By the numbers, um, you can see the different things we've done, but I think the most important thing is what I've highlighted in red. We've serviced over 175 passengers to date, getting them out uh, in their community. Wind in their hair, smiles on their faces. And I, I, I can tell you a number of stories of just how many different people have come to the, whether it's a, a, a brother coming from Denmark to visit his sister who's in a care facility and being able to go out for a ride with his sister. Or a couple that have been married 61 years and he's in one facility and she's in another facility getting them together to go out on a hot date because they don't get to do that anymore. So it's been very remarkable, lots of good stories and, and um, lots of time put in this. We've had over 1,100 hours of volunteer time. We are a volunteer run organization. 
Our 2021 20 plan is we want to further our outreach. And part of our challenge is getting just people getting to know that we exist. But we'll be going into the schools, the residents and the facilities and being active in those places by giving uh, presentations and having uh, more information available. We're going to be more obviously more active in our fundraising because of the charities, charitable status we have now. So we're, we're looking to uh, up that market as well. We'll continue to seek more pilots to take people up for rides as well as looking for people to help us with fundraising and promotions. We're designing some promotional materials. I, I left you with a card like this that uh, we circulate around that gives information to people to get to our website. On our website, for example, you can, as an individual, book a ride at any time. So you can, don't have to be in a facility. You don't have to be uh, under care of anyone. You can, as an individual who's in a private residence, book a, a, a trip and we can come to your house and take you for a ride. Operationally, we want to get a second bike and we want to start expanding onto the Saanich Peninsula. One of my dreams is to have the ability of six bikes in the, eventually and do what's called a long ride. And they do this in Europe right now. And a long ride, for example, is going from Copenhagen to Stockholm. That's not a one day ride. So we're looking at maybe doing a ride up island from Sydney to Nanaimo and taking six bikes on a ride and having passengers in there, they're going out and getting them out for a ride. We have a goal of $19,000 this year, and you can see how we're going to spend that money. Uh, obviously, the biggest chunk is going to getting a second bike and getting that equipped. We have some operational costs in, in ensuring it. To ensure one bike is $2,500, so you can see a, a good chunk of that operations goes into insurance. And we'd like to further train our volunteers and equip them. Thank you. And I want to thank you because you've been instrumental in keeping us going this last year and certainly in conjunction with the community. But there are a number of people we'd like to thank. We have our pilots to thank. We have our passengers to thank. And we have the care attendants of the different facilities that take, pa that take these people out on their own time usually. We have our, our supporters to thank. All care, Sydney All Care here in, in Sydney has provided space to store our bikes and will continue to store all of our bikes up to six bikes. They're going to provide the, that space. I also would like to recognize the um, Sydney Fire Department for allowing us to stay in the, the location we are because they were uh, very accommodating in providing a, a storage, validating our storage locker so that we could keep it there in the location it is. And I'd also like to recognize Russ Hayes Cycle. They've uh, agreed to service our bikes on an ongoing basis up to, again, that fleet of six. I'd like to thank those that stepped up. Sydney Lions Club, the town of Sydney, Sydney Waterfront Inns and Suites to provide us funding to go through this year when we weren't a charity. That funding came forward. Oh. It's been an exciting year, first year where we've been active. Um, and we continue to see the smiles on the faces and the wind in their hair of this uh, active citizenship. Every one of these people in this picture has a story to tell. And it's one that uh, you could ask any one of the pilots that sit behind me that they could tell you a story of their rides. It is something that is very rewarding. It's something that's very encouraging. And it's something that definitely gives to the community. Thank you. Any questions? I'm Thank you. Uh, any questions uh, from Council of Mr. Duck? Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Just a comment. Thank you for the presentation. And, uh, you know, one thing we hear about uh, the, the elderly or uh, people who have disabilities is that loneliness and isolation factor. And so I just love that this is something that uh, helps to address that in our commu community. So uh, kudos to you guys for doing that. Um, one other thing is uh, when I was at, at UBCM, they talked about um, funds coming available through the provincial government for uh, to support more active transportation sorts of things. Um, so I'm not sure if you guys are onto that and how this might plug into that, but uh, perhaps there might be some opportunities uh, there, perhaps. We've certainly taken a look at it, and, and just going back to your, your previous point about uh, that isolation, it's interesting because uh, Shoal Centre, for example, hosts an, a monthly luncheon for people that are uh, housebound, and they bring them in and provide them a meal, and we've had an opportunity to present to them 
and subsequently there have been interest in taking rides from us. One of our challenges is that we are um, booking computer-based right now and, and we'd love to have a telephone in service, but we just mm -hmm. don't have the volunteers to respond to telephone uh, requests and booking. But to your second question, we have looked at that active transport granting. Um, we think we have some better channels through, because we're now a charity through the Victoria Foundation and specifically the Sandwich Peninsula Community Foundation to provide funding because of uh, the way we integrate uh, multiple generations from school children through to seniors and are including our pilots. Good, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions, Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Mr. Duck, and thank you for what you're doing in the community. Um, and thank you for answering the question about what happened on the airport. I was more than curious as to why they took them out, so that was a great answer to a mystery for me. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's absolutely fabulous. Um, I don't know why I touched on this when you first did the presentation. I'm thinking back to my, my in-laws who both passed away last year and how much they would have enjoyed this. And um, it's a tremendous benefit to our community and you should all be applauded and, and thanks overwhelmingly because you're doing a great service. And thanks very much. Thank you. And I'd like to also acknowledge that we're, there are now three active cyclists on the uh, council board. So we're, hopefully we can graduate you to pilots. <laughs> Seeing no other questions, I'd just like to offer my congratulations uh, to your organization each year. Uh, Sydney has long had a grants and aid uh, budget of, uh, of a, a rather small amount of about 15,000 and we get four or five times that amount in requests and last year council will recall we uh, gave a small contribution uh, as seed money to uh, to Cycling Without Age and, and we're really pleased to see the success you've made uh, in your startup year and uh, look forward to continued success. Yes and that was instrumental that represented more than 10% of our income this year. <laughs> So we will be back again applying this year. <laughs> Thank again, you. Thank you very much. So we'll now move on uh, in our agenda. Our next uh, agenda item is bylaws and uh, item 5A is uh, bylaw number 2185, miscellaneous fees and charges, amendment number 18, and we have a recommendation. I'll move that the bylaw be adopted. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. We'll just let the chamber. Uh, Thank you. And then we'll move on to uh, development permits, uh, item 5B1, a development variance permit application number DV100287, 9495 Maryland Drive, uh, to reduce the minimum building envelope width uh, in order to allow a two lot uh, subdivision. It has come before previous council and uh, it did go out for community notice. And um, as, of, uh, as of last or late last week, we had no written submissions received. I'll move that the application be approved. And discussion, call the question, all those in favor? Oh, sorry, did you have a question? Go ahead, Councillor Garner. Thanks. Um, I gave some thought to this application, um, reflected on it over the holidays, and I, I was kind of looking at it from a different perspective and how the town benefits from developments like this. And uh, you may recall I asked questions whether or not there'd be, if these homes could be suited, and we were told no if they were gonna use environmental standards higher than what the BC code asks and it was no. So I'm looking at it from the perspective of our community and you know, if, if the home stayed as it was, you could, you could upgrade it, probably make it more environmentally uh, sound than, than new ones for that matter. Um, it's not providing any housing opportunities in our community, which we sorely need as, the, as our study showed. Um, so basically what we have is two properties that are going to sell for over a million dollars and we have an abundance of those in our community now and it does fit in with the neighborhood there it's been done down on Webster and a couple other places in that area but um, I'm gonna vote against the recommendation just because I I just feel like we need to be doing more and this is just the same old to me and I just don't see how 
doing these developments over and over and over again is, is, is not benefiting the community. It's benefiting the top 1% who can afford to buy it. And had there been suites attached to it, then that would be a different story for me because then at least we're getting something from it as a town. We're having some secondary living spaces for people who need them. As it sits now, I, I just don't see how this benefits us other than a tax base. So um, I'll be voting against it. Okay. Uh, Councillor Wainwright. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. So, <coughs> excuse me, I appreciate those comments, but um, it's a very small <coughs> variance that we're looking at here. And it's solely because we have this um, historical sort of approach that says you've got to have a, a, a square building envelope uh, in order to be able to do a subdivision. So th these two lots are going to have a building envelope as large as what we're proposing, just, uh, sorry, not uh, what we're proposing, as large as what we normally require, just rectangular instead of square. So this is um, a pretty small philosophical di difference. And I, and I appreciate you can ask the question, so what's in it for the town? So when you have a construction project for two new houses, ignoring the who's gonna buy it, um, you have employment created. Uh, from all the trades and the construction activity, and there's spin-off benefits to the economy. So you can't say there's nothing in it for us. Um, what you can say, perhaps, is that you rather see a different form of housing, and the way to address that really is with the zoning itself, not with... Um, you know, drawing a fine line on whether you give a variance or not. So that would really be my suggestion. If if we feel we've got to change the character of the housing that is being created, we should probably have a hard look at that in the OCP. It, I don't have any problem supporting this because I think it really is um, an archaic concept to expect the square building envelope. Thank you, Councillor. Any, any, uh, Mr. Humble. <clears throat> I just wanted to follow up on Councillor Wainwright's comments. So uh, this was also referred to staff to look at the section of the subdivision bylaw that deals with the requirement for a certain dimension associated with the building. So staff are looking at this. This would come back to Council. If Council gives that uh, approval, then Quite frankly, there'd be no need for a variance. There's no development permit associated with this, so it would eliminate that entirely, and someone could just simply come forward with a building permit and build those uh, those dwellings by by right. So I just wanted to point that we will be bringing that forward to Council as per uh, their resolution. Too great. Thanks for that update, Mr. Humble. Uh, any further comment? Uh, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? We have one opposed, the motion carries. Thank you. We'll now move to adoption of our minutes. Uh, first from our special... Yeah? Oh, I passed the big one. Okay. Uh, item 5B2 is uh, development, development Variance Permit Application Number DV100290 for 2313 and 2317 Oakville Avenue. Um, we have a presentation this evening by Mr. Raj Bupinder. Uh, from Raj Home Designs, welcome, and um, we look forward to your presentation. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I just have a few brief words, uh, uh, as this is nothing complicated, and, and the staff has put it uh, beautifully in their recommendation. So we, we started this process uh, more than a year ago, with with a different concept uh, uh, of a flat roof, uh, two flat roof dwellings. And uh, as per the council's uh, direction, we went with the, <clears throat> with a design which is more in line with the neighborhood. And we went with the two craftsman style houses uh, with the high pitch roof and uh, 
to <coughs> Gable Thomas on the sides. And we were doing okay till, uh, till the engineer changed the uh, <coughs> flood level elevation because of which the design was not in line anymore. But uh, it still uh, works with a little bit of variance uh, of about 0.53 meters in height. And that's, that's what we are asking for uh, to go ahead with the <laughs> project. It's, a, it's, a, it's owned by a couple of gentlemen who, along with their family, uh, want to move into the neighborhood. They're both senior citizens. One of them is sitting here <laughs> in the chambers. And uh, they, they, this, they've been wanting to build it as soon as move and move into the neighborhood as they feel it's, it's, it's the best location for them to live. Uh, and that, that's just a brief words that I had uh, other than the staff recommendations. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you yep. for your, thank you for your comments. And yep. uh, does council have any uh, council members have any questions, Mr. Bupinder? Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank we'll, you. Thank you. We'll now be considering as council. Thank yep. you. So I might uh, I might turn to staff if I might uh, through Mr. Humble. Just uh, this is not the first time this uh, application has come before council. Uh, it's gone through a process. Uh, the presenter spoke briefly to it, but I might ask Mr. Humble if uh, staff might speak to how it's come before us this evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'll um, defer to uh, Ms. Verhagen, our Senior Manager of Current Planning, and she can give a sort of a brief summary. Thank, Thank you. you. Through the Mayor, Council has seen this development application before, not this specific variance application, but Council did review the development permit for the form and character or the look of the two small lot single family dwellings which are to be built here. Um, there was a development permit application made in December 2017 for the, the form and character of the two small lot houses as part of their subdivision proposal. Um, that development permit was reviewed by Council in May of two, 2018. Uh, Council passed a motion requesting a project redesign. A variance was also applied for then, and the variance for increasing lot coverage and there was one other change. Um, reducing side interior setbacks so that the garages could join be to a zero lot line. That variance application was denied. A redesign was presented to council and ultimately approved by council. Um, the subdivision was reviewed as well and towards the end of the subdivision process in 2019, um, there is a new flood construction or flood hazard report submitted by the, pro the engineer associated with the application. And that did, as the applicant said, that did increase the minimum floor elevation from four meters geodetic to 4.53. That effectively pushes the houses up out of the ground to meet that, that requirement, that minimum floor elevation. So the subdivision has been approved, but building permits have not been issued. This issue of the, the lowest point in the house, the, the basement floor elevation needs to be resolved. Okay. Thank you. Um, any questions of staff, uh, councillors? Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. I, uh, I'm, I'm just curious, The why, why wouldn't they have identified that initially, like the, the requirement to, or was that as a result of the redesign that something changed and then they had to get a, a new engineering report or? Uh, no, the, the flood hazard report was submitted by the engineer associated with the application in the development permit process that was going on concurrently with the subdivision review. The two applications are being reviewed by staff at once. So as staff was reviewing the flood hazard report, we asked for information on how the report was reviewed by, by the professional engineer. They then submitted a revision to the report which increased that minimum basement floor elevation from four meters to 4.53. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Uh, I have one, and that is, um, does the um, does the flood control level is it influenced because this uh, former half story, uh, well now what will be more above ground, is going to be a residence? Is going to be a suite versus if it was just a basement to uh, the upper stories? 
engineers do consider habitable space, living space, differently than just storage space. But if they're, if it's living space or space for goods that can be damaged by floodwaters, it should be higher. It should be up out of harm's way. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further questions of staff, we do have um, a recommendation. I'll move that owners and tenants and occupational property within 75 meters, 246 feet of 2313 and 2317 Oakville Avenue be notified regarding development variance permit application number DV100290 to vary the requirements for height and number of permitted stories and that any written correspondence re received before to, to council at the time of consideration of approval of the variance. I'll second that. Thank you. Further discussion, Councillor uh, Councillor Gunner. Yeah, I, dr I drove the area the other day and um, was looking at the one that we had approved previously, just up the street, and it's quite big. For for me, I, I the, I'm having a real problem with the three stories. It's quite imposing in the neighborhood. It doesn't really fit with a lot of the neighborhood. And I know that that can happen as buildings are redeveloped going forward, but. I actually had to crane in my vehicle to look to see the top of the roof from the side of the road. So um, I can't imagine as a neighbor what that would be like, but that's what I'm struggling with on this is the height of it, the stories. Um, but having said that, I'm more than willing to put this forward and want to hear what the public has to say and the neighbors and before I make any decision. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Councillor Pell. Thank you. Um, I too went around the neighborhood and saw that there was a variety of uh, building types, uh, whether they were attached or unattached, flat roofs and pitched roof. I think there is enough variety and there are some tall buildings to counterbalance the height of this. The, the gain in all of this is twofold. I think it is uh, that there is going to be a suite I think that um, that's an important gain for our community. And I also think that the suite is going to be above the floodplain is, um, makes for, for a happier living, not having to worry about whether you've got a sump pump or need a sump pump and things like that. So I think given the circumstances, I'm, um, I'm happy to move this forward and as Councillor Garnett said and hear from the public, but I think that this is something uh, I can support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I concur with Councillor Fallett's points. I have no trouble supporting this application. Um, this developer has previously come forward. They have received comments from the staff. They have worked with them to redesign something that aesthetically fits within the neighborhood. The reason it sticks up this much further um, on a quarter of the roof area, which is just the peaks of the roofs, is because they have allowed or they have built it so that there would be a rental suite on the bottom they could lower the height of their house if they eliminated a suite and created just a one you know dwelling house again but we want that suite um, and they have done as councillor Fallot has pointed out something good for their tenants in the, well and legal um, by raising it above the flood construction level so that this is making our town more resilient to climate change um, there are many houses existing in that neighborhood that may be lower in height that when we get a king tide and a big storm next time, we're gonna have some really soggy basements. So the houses in this area are going to have to redevelop to be higher, all of them. Every one of these properties is going to, over the future, as they need to be redeveloped, raise up because of that flood construction level. This just happens to be one of the first ones turning over. Um, and the fact that um, I forget where I was going with this, so it probably doesn't matter. <laughs> I think it was just the, the, the one quarter of the peak of the roof. And that, oh yes, and as the staff pointed out, they could have also kept their building design as it was and made a flat roof, which I, I know many of us on council heard from people in the community that one of the things they didn't like about many of the new re redevelopments was that they were not in keeping with the town aesthetic and they were putting in these flat roofs. And so here we have these poor people who have created a development that fits with what many people have expressed as the aesthetic preference they have for the town, who you know now may get voted down because they didn't make a flat roof. And, and I, I would not be comfortable with that. So um, I am very much in support of this application as it is. 
Any further comments from council? Uh, hearing none, I'll uh, call the question. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. We'll now move on to uh, adoption of our minutes uh, from uh, the first from our special council meeting of December 12th. Two Second. Uh, those in favor? Motion carries. And uh, second for our regular council meeting of December 16th. We have adoption. Second. All those in favor? And that motion carries as well. Thank you. We have no business uh, not completed, no business arising, no petitions and delegations. I'll move briefly to, uh, to a mayor's report. Um, Happy New Year to everyone. I know we're um, 13 days in, but uh, welcome to the new year and to the new decade. Um, we met uh, some 41 times as Committee of the Whole and Council last year, had a wide variety of business come before us, and uh, I look forward to working together uh, this year uh, to move the community's business forward. Uh, and um, uh, next Monday, for the public's uh, information, those who aren't aware, We'll have a uh, very important process uh, commence, uh, annual process, our budget deliberations, or our budget uh, meetings and deliberations. And next Monday evening at Committee of the Whole, we'll have a presentation from uh, Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Hissick, on the uh, 2020 uh, budget and the four years beyond that. So welcome, uh, welcome the public, uh, uh, residents, uh, businesses, uh, community stakeholders to uh, tune in to our budget process for, uh, for 2020. We just have uh, one uh, council report this evening. Um, Councilor Garner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this past Saturday, I attended the meeting with the City Museum and Archives Society as their liaison. Just a few updated points. Um, the Sayanich art exhibit attracted over 800 visitors and sold approximately $1,200 worth of art on behalf of the artists. But more importantly, the museum feels that relationships that were formed were invaluable going forward. Um, currently, the Lego exhibit is being offered, and in the first two weeks, there's been around 900 visitors. It's extremely popular. Um, plan a visit if you have kids or grandkids. Um, <laughs> the Star Wars exhibit's quite amazing. It's a lot of pieces. Um, the museum is also looking into a partnership with the SBIA to pursue the viability of a project that involves the On the Spot app. This is all new to me. It allows users to access virtual walking tours, archival photographs, audio recordings, and interacting with those worldwide. So this is something that they're pretty excited about, and hopefully that will come to fruition. Some good news in closing. Museum ended the 2019 year with a surplus of $21,540. It's quite an achievement given that they don't charge admission and rely on visitor donations. I'd like to congratulate the staff, Peter and Alyssa, as well as the board for their forward thinking in pursuing different ways to help their financial bottom line. In the past year and since a couple of years, they've adopted uh, a machine for payment, which has helped them immensely, as well as looking and applying for several grants and seeking public sponsors. They've all been significant benefit to them. So they're, they're, they're pursuing a model which is um, working. Uh, to this point and uh, is helping their bottom line. So it's excellent work on their part. Thank you. Thanks for those, uh, that update, uh, Councillor Garnett. We'll now move, uh, we don't have any committee reports. We'll move to staff reports. Item 13A is uh, with regards to the staff report uh, on uh, met funding, met uh, sorry, funding for the Shaw Centre for the Sailor Sea. And we ha have a recommendation as per the report. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. I'll uh, move uh, the recommend, uh, revised recommendation and what's in the report uh, that council refer the proposed methods for monitoring the financial performance of the Shaw Centre for the Salish Sea to budget deliberations and that the Shaw Centre be asked to make a presentation to council as part of budget deliberations. Second. Uh, discussion? Uh, council Wainwright. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think it might be better for us if we refer the methods of monitoring uh, financial performance to Committee of the Whole because um, during our budget deliberations I think we're focused really more on the merits of, uh, of funding and um, the monitoring of their performance is, is um, arguably a different thing and might distract us a little bit from uh, deciding where we want the fund to go. Um, it, it, so my thought is that it's probably a, a better form for it and uh, uh, we routinely have uh, presentations from organizations that committed the whole. 
I, I would be willing okay. to uh, amend that if I would concur with that. Well, I, I just have a comment first, if I okay, might, sure. and, and uh, appreciating those, those, those comments, is that um, there's, there's going to be a two-step process here. Uh, one is that uh, we do have uh, a funding request uh, from the um, uh, from the acquiring of the Salish Sea, uh, for uh, a level of increased funding for 2021 and beyond. So, council last year during our budget deliberations it approved an increase of funding of sixty thousand dollars for 2019, which took funding to one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, and we also approved those in those budget deliberations an increase in funding of an additional eighty thousand for uh, 2020, which we're commencing now, uh, that brought the total funding to 205,000. The, uh, the original request was for multi-year funding at that higher level, uh, and Council resolved last year to provide the 2019 and 2020 funding, and then seek a staff to work with uh, aquarium uh, staff to bring about uh, metrics that uh, could be uh, brought forward that would be presented to council on a periodic basis uh, to see the performance of the uh, to the performance of the center. What we have before us this evening is we have that report that uh, a report from staff having worked with the aquarium and the report from the aquarium uh, presenting over some eight or nine pages a presentation of what those metrics would look like in format uh, coming before us. Um, those metrics will not take effect whatever they are and last, during our budget deliberations in the coming weeks, we decide to uh, provide uh, additional funding in one or more years in the future. So I think, in a way, this resolution, uh, the resol resolution as originally made, is appropriate in that Council can, uh, during its budget deliberations, make the first important decision as to whether and what the additional funding will be, how much and for how long, and if so, uh, then uh, the metrics uh, would uh, we would pass a resolution to uh, to approve those metrics. Um, council, the reason it's being presented tonight is so that if council had some questions in terms of the appropriateness of these metrics, um, it's a pretty full report. But if if there was uh, any suggestions for amendments uh, to suggest to staff to work with the aquarium, I would suggest that those amendments might be very minor or none at all. I, but quite frankly, I'm in support of of them as they're presented, uh, but, uh, but that it wouldn't be a, a large discussion uh, at the time of our budget deliberations. So just a, a framework of process uh, that, I might, uh, that I might add. Uh, Councilor Rintoul? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. And I would concur with your comments around finding the, uh, the monitoring as recommended and uh, appropriate. I take it staff have worked closely with the center, uh, Pauline and, and Janine, uh, to put this together. So I'm quite comfortable with proceeding uh, on the basis that uh, you know this is giving us the opportunity to have some specific information coming in moving forward to, to monitor uh, financial performance. So I'm, I'm happy with the motion as recommended. Okay, if I might just add the, um, in the recommendation requesting that the, uh, the, uh, the querying for the Salish Sea come forward and make a present during, presentation during budget elaborations, it's not to present these metrics as you know how you got to that point of, of the metrics and we do appreciate there is uh, fairly current information in the, in the example of metrics that you provided but perhaps in that presentation in a brief presentation you could give us uh, provide to council uh, information of where you are currently uh, given that we are going to make it be making an important funding decision uh, for the uh, for the future Any further comment Councillor O'Keefe uh, thank you mr. mayor so my understanding, uh, if, if this goes forward, is that if we had some suggestions on maybe things we wanted to tweak a bit in terms of the format or the metrics, that we could suggest those perhaps this evening, that staff could take those back and um, consider those uh, adjustments with the center, and then the center would come back sometime during budget deliberations to make a presentation and staff would bring back any amended 
sort of metrics. And I, that, yeah, I think the met, yeah, I think the metrics would come back, and if there was some some small amendment or, you know, or two, that that's fine. Not not again, not to present those metrics. Yeah. And, and we could ask if we have questions about the metrics, but as I say, I'm I'm generally supportive of what's been presented to us and, and not looking for changes. But if, if council members at this time wished to make comment, uh, as, as you may be indicating on, on a particular metric, or um, I think t staff can take that suggestion to uh, to discuss with the aquarium. Okay, so I, I, I just have a couple com comments to make then, if it's appropriate. The floor is yours. Uh, okay, um, so one of the, the, the comments, and the center has responded to some of these anyways, but I'll I'll bring them up just for the benefit of, uh, of the audience and for, for council. Uh, one of the things we had talked about was perhaps uh, including the metric on the value to schools, and it uh, sounds like the uh, center is willing to uh, incorporate that. Um, there was also mention in uh, the staff report about maintaining uh, reserve balances for the center's operating fund and the capital uh, reserve uh, balances as well, that those would become tracking mechanisms and so I'm just proposing and I believe the center and staff are on board that there, those uh, would be uh, reported annually and presented to, to council as as part of the metrics um, there's also uh, you know I had asked about whether it might be possible for the the center to track the source of where uh, visitors are coming from in in terms of are they coming locally? Are they coming from other parts of the CRD, from further fee af afield? Um, and the value to that is that it helps us explain to the community uh, the, you know, the investment that we're making in the center in terms of uh, all the, the business or the people from outside the community that are coming. And my understanding is that the, while the center doesn't have uh, those, that available right now, that 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 is something that uh, they would continue to work on. Uh, what else did I have? Um, just uh, in terms of th the fundraising, um, you know, one of my concerns is that you know there hasn't been a consistent fundraising plan in, in place, and that I note from the financial statements provided that even with the town's uh, contribution, that they're still requiring about 130,000 a year in other donations. And um, so, you know, I'd like to see a little bit more information, maybe when they come forward with their, their presentation on what they're doing to get that fundraising campaign uh, going. Um, I also talked about um, not necessarily uh, using it as a metric, but in terms of return of it on investment. And I know that's really hard to capture. But uh, because it is a significant amount of money that the town is in investing, it would be useful if we had some more uh, information about how that's, that's going to be uh, calculated in the future. Um, and I think, oh, there was just one other thing, I th a minor thing. Um, I believe in the staff report it talked about tracking membership, but I didn't see that in the in the template f from the center. So just to include that, and I think that they're uh, on track to do that as well. So that's all I have. Thank you. Do other council members have uh, comments or suggestions, um, Mr. Hissick? Sorry, was our oh. was our original motion amended? I don't believe yeah. so. Um, the original motion was the one that Councillor O'Keefe made. I made a comment that uh, it might be better at a committee of the whole. You've made a comment that maybe we don't even need to do that. And I'm actually happy with that solution. Um, so I'm not sure what motion we're actually dealing with. So do you point. have the original motion? Uh, yeah. Please. So that one dealt with going um, straight to budget deliberations, not committee of the whole. 
Okay, but there was two parts to there the motion. There was. Would you like me to read it out? Please, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That council refer the proposed methods for monitoring the financial performance of the Shaw Centre for the Salish Sea to budget deliberations and that the Shaw Centre be asked to make a presentation to council as part of budget deliberations. Okay. And so if uh, we would leave it to staff to recommend when that presentation uh, that comes forward or any... any um, okay. Uh, Councillor Wainwright? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I've heard um, from yourself and Councillor Rentoul, and I'm basically in favor of it as well, of, of simply approving the proposed uh, financial performance metrics and happy to see them come to budget and give a presentation about why they need the additional money and what they're going to do with it rather than a presentation on what the metrics are going to be. Um, but the motion is to get them to do a presentation on the metrics. No, no. Oh, no, sorry. No, no. No? No. You go ahead and speak. No, my my understanding was it wasn't going to be a presentation on, on the metrics. Is that my understanding was that there was a desire to first approve that it it appeared that it would be premature to approve the metrics until we had decided to approve the funding. And so that's why the motion was crafted the way it, it was, because there seemed to be a desire to, let's look at the funding first and approve it. And then if we approve it, then look at the, the, the metrics. And if the metrics that are provided are these, I don't see us having a huge discussion about it. So did I get that right? That, no point to discuss the metrics if we're not going to give the money, is the way I understood it. Well, that would certainly make sense. Yeah. <laughs> so I anticipate that we would have the discussion during budget deliberations whether to approve the funding. And part of that would be that uh, we would also approve the metrics at that time. But the presentation would focus on the funding request. Yes. Okay. okay. We're clar uh, clarified yeah. on that. Very good. Any further comment from Council? Councillor Duncan. <clears throat> so as I look at the original recommendation, so if we aren't going to really care what the metrics are because we might not approve their funding going forward and then they have no obligation to update their metrics for us, um, I, I don't see the problem in simply not going with this recommendation as it is and then we approve the funding and then it goes forward. I know Councillor O'Keefe has comments for it that you, they can go back and forth and maybe they'll come forward later or maybe they won't. But what I'm worried about is the way that the discussion is going now is that we're gonna end up deferring to another discussion about these metrics when we may not even have to have one by the, by the sounds of it, that, that maybe your comments can be addressed as they go you know, through staff and through working with them and by the time they come back with their budget, they'll have come up with something anyway. So my preference would, would really just be to, to go with this and unless there's something really, really glaring that needs to come up for discussion again after we approve or do not approve, you know, if, if we approve more budget um, going forward, then we deal with it then. But otherwise, I'd rather approve this now and just shelve, <coughs> shelve the idea of, of having to have another discussion about the metrics. Okay, just one last time for clarity is, is that just because we're referring the metrics to the budget deliberations doesn't mean we have to have a discussion about them. It just means that we will make the decision about funding and if appropriate, we'll then go ahead and, and give final approval. If Council wishes to go ahead and approve the metrics this evening, it, it's, it, it, it has the same effect. Councillor Key. So I'm quite happy to approve the metrics tonight and... Um, you know, I think, you know, based on the, the back and forth discussions that we've had with staff and some ad additional information with the center, I'm happy with, you know, what's, what's happening. And so, you know, if, if that's council's wish to say, yes, let's move ahead, it's, it's fine. I, I would be willing to uh, either rescind the motion or to, to, to make a new one if that's council's uh, pleasure what is council's pleasure I think
think it would be simpler if we just approved the performance metrics and then dealt with the funding request at budget. Okay, I'm uh, I'm comfortable with that. If if there's I'll, I'll if we have a motion, or we have a res rescinding, and then we have a, a motion. But just one comment in the new motion, if it's brought forward, that the metrics to take effect uh, based on council's decision of, of uh, future funding. They're okay. not going to take effect if, unless we just. Yeah, but it's contingent. It's contingent on future funding. Okay. So you will move to. So uh, shall I withdraw, withdraw my motion? Withdraw. Okay. Second. Okay. Yep. Second or seconds. And so we have no motion on the floor. Okay. So I'll move that. Uh, council approve the proposed proposed methods for monitoring the financial performance of the Shaw Center for the Salish Sea, and that that be no. contingent. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Upon council approving future funding. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? I'll call the question. All in favor? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. And do we, we don't presently have a presentation scheduled from the Center for the Salish Sea for budget deliberation. Should we make a resolution to that effect regarding the budget request? I, I think the message has been received and uh, <laughs> we'll try and get them for February 3rd if that's okay. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Council. Um, Move to item 13B, the monthly building report for November and December. I move receipt for information. Second. Those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. And uh, we'll now move to item 14A. Uh, we have a request from funding uh, regarding a residential school celebration. Uh, corresponds from Vern Jack, dated January 8th. A move that funding in the amount of $1,000 be approved. Second. Uh, discussion? Uh, Councillor Duncan and Councillor Garnett. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess um, Mayor through to staff. Just where will that thousand dollars be coming from? Do we still have a, kind of a pot of of money that we've got for contingent expenses like this? Where are we finding this money from? Council has about twenty five hundred dollars in discretionary funding within the council budget for uh, sponsorships like this, either there or uh, the grants budget, whatever you, you prefer. Okay, Councillor Garner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, have we had any further communication with the applicant? No. So I'm just, I was, if we have more money and they were finding they needed more, I'd be fine with approving more if they needed it. So I just wanted to know if there was any further requests. Just the initial request. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Rintoul. Hey, yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll uh, uh, indicate my support for the motion, certainly. Um, but also given the timeline here uh, uh, coming so uh, so quickly with the event taking place on the 15th of January, it would have been my preference to have seen some more specificity around how the funds were intended to be spent in a budget for the uh, program itself. So I do have some concern with regard to the nature in which uh, it's been brought before council in, in this format. But uh, again, given the timing event, I understand the urgency to pledge your support and I'm happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, I'll call the question. Those in favor? If not, motion carries unanimous. Thank you. We have no new business, so we'll move to correspondence for information. Move receipt. Second. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimous. We have no notices of motion and no motion to go on camera. We look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you, Council. Thank you.